Okay, everybody, welcome back to Honestly Bilal. I'm your host, Bilal Ahmed, fourth year medical student at the University of Toledo. Today, I'm really honored to bring a guest who I've actually gotten to meet in person for the first time. This is somebody who I actually have met. Uh, this is Dr. Gary Wirtz. He is a cataract surgeon in Lexington, Kentucky. He is a chief medical advisor for Omega Ophthalmics. He's also the chief medical editor for Millennial Eye. Um, he is a renowned uh, surgeon, um, host, of, host of Off the Grid, the ophthalmology podcast that is probably one of the biggest out there. And it's, it's, a, it's a model for everything that, you know, podcasters are trying to do. And, and I, looked for, I look to inspir get inspiration from that. And uh, it's an honor to have him on. So thank you, Dr. Wirtz. Yeah, and uh, fellow Kentuckian. So that's another important thing that uh, we share in common. Absolutely, absolutely. And he was, and, you know, Dr. Wirtz was really kind to, you know, he, he actually uh, invited me via direct message on Twitter to come watch some cataract surgery down in Lexington. So uh, I got a direct message from him over the whole COVID-19 uh, period that, hey, if you want to watch some cataract surgeries, come, come, uh, come on down. And he was kind enough to invite me, he even got me lunch. So uh, we had a good time down there and he, he you know, we talked about it. We're like, hey, how about you come on to Honestly Blow? And he said, yeah, I'd be glad to. So we made it happen and I'm glad to be here with you. And, uh, you know, you have a really cool story and I'm really wanting to share it with everybody else out there today. Well, Bilal, I'm so impressed with um, just the excitement and the energy that you've brought to ophthalmology, especially to the inspire to the aspiring ophthalmologists who are um, in a weird time right now with COVID. Yep. Um, you know, trying to get experience and exposure in ophth to ophthalmology while you're a medical student in the best of times is difficult. Um, and I know that you've had some challenges um, during this time to get uh, exposure. And uh, you know, when I when I realized that you were in my neck of the woods, I, I definitely wanted to. Um, invite you in because this is, and I think you'll, you'll realize this, ophthalmology is a specialty that is very collegial. Um, there's a lot of mentorship opportunities, and I really feel like it's full of people who um, have, I think, want to pay it back and in some ways pay forward the, the good deeds that were done to them uh, maybe earlier in their career. So it wasn't too long ago I was sitting in your, sh in your shoes and I remember what it was like. So um, I definitely wanted to offer that and, and try to be a resource if I could. Yeah, well, thanks for paying it forward. I mean, you were even on that mentorship webinar that some people hosted, like uh, Dr. Andrea Tooley and, and some other people, and you were there and you were checking it out just with the rest, rest of us students. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, so, I mean, this it's a different thing to be a guest like this. I'm used to being the host, so it's kind of nice to wear the, a different hat. Um, you know, also, I think if you want to be a good mentor, mm -hmm. it's really important to listen to the mentees and say, and, and listen to what are they looking for and a mentor because what I think someone might need um, mm -hmm. or expect might not be what they really need and expect. And if I'm thinking about being a mentor, you know, it's incumbent upon me to, to do my research and understand what this generation of, of young yeah. people need out of a mentor. So that's what I was doing. I was, you know, kind of trying to figure out what it, should, what it looks like to be a good mentor. Yeah. And you, and you have been so far. And it's, and this is a step that I really wanted to, uh, you know, I appreciate. And then, and sharing your story today is, is part of that mentorship. And I think we can all learn from it. And uh, what's really interesting that you told me when I was down in Lexington was that when you started medical school, you wanted to be a trauma surgeon. Uh, and then that did not pan out. You actually found ophthalmology. So talk about that transition. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I always worked with my hands growing up. Uh, I grew up on, on a farm. My, my father is a physician, but we moved out to the country and, and uh, we had a big farm. And so I was always, you know, fixing things, taking things apart, boat motors and, you know, rebuilding them and, you know, putting up fences and just fixing things. So I've always really liked to work with my hands. Sure. And, and since my dad was an internist, I thought I'd be a surgeon, you know, just to, to kind of one up him a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I just felt like I like working with my hands. I felt like trauma surgery was probably like, you know, the Navy SEALs of, 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 op, or of uh, being a physician is kind of like yeah. the baddest group of, you know, do anything, tough as people, tough as nails, fix anything, put anything back. There. So, you know, I think that's just sort of my personality. It's my ego probably. I mean, oh. to be honest, is just, I want to do the hardest and best that I can. Yeah. Um, but when I was in, in medical school, you know, um, and we can talk a little bit about this, but, you know, surgeons sort of have a reputation for being a little bit um, sociopathic. You know, they're not necessarily the um, people that you want to invite out um, for dinner and that's yeah. not necessarily the best, best of, of friends and colleagues. They can, they tend to be, um, sort of hardcore. And I just realized that I just didn't think that that's who I wanted to become. Sure. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there's exceptions to that rule. I know some very nice surgeons, but yeah. it's really hard, um, to, to get through that training 
and um, you know, not have it affect you. And I just didn't see myself fitting in with that specialty. And I, again, I hate using stereotypes, but it was just a personal choice for me. But sure. I still wanted to do something with, with my hands. And right. um, it was kind of between plastics and ophthalmology. And I ultimately determined that ophthalmology was going to be what I wanted to do. Right. And you, and you were also an athlete growing up uh, in Michigan. And, and um, you, you yeah. talked to me about how, you know, you kind of see cataract surgery when, when we were in the OR together, you told me how, you know, jumping from room to room, it's like a game. It's like a sport. You feel like you, you have an objective and you like to accomplish that objective. So talk about that a bit. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, ophthalmology is a highly technical specialty. I mean, there is, uh, there are other specialties clearly very technical, but in my day, you know, I'm trying to get through, you know, potentially upwards of 30 surgeries right. um, that requires, uh, you know, a lot of different people um, and, and each surgery I kind of think about is like an at bat, if you will, yeah. you know, so I played baseball growing up. I was a first baseman and you know, I always loved baseball and I always loved the statistics of, of baseball. I liked, you know, batting percentage on base percentage, strikeout, you know, mm-hmm. all, you know, errors, et cetera. And, you know, I really do think about every surgery as, you know, this is, this is a surgery I want to get through without complication. I want to get through in a certain pace. I want to have a certain pace through my day so that my patients aren't waiting and I'm, I'm utilizing my staff. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm, I have a lot of metrics that I'm, I'm constantly analyzing. And of course, you know, if we need to slow down or we need to take, um, you know, a detour, the patient outcome is always first. Sure. Um, so I'm not artificially focusing on those things, but there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it. And because cataract surgery um, is really over with and usually, you know, 10, 15 minutes, yeah. you know, you have, you have feedback immediately on, as to whether or not you succeeded or not. Whereas like if you're doing a gallbladder or you're doing an appendectomy or a hemicolectomy or knee replacement, you know, you may not know about the function or wound infection or, or um, you know, other complications for weeks down the road. So I do think that cataract surgery is very much like a sport because of the instant feedback mm-hmm. that's tied directly to the performance of the person doing it. And so we can collect statistics not only of ca- complications, but refractive outcomes. Um, and I, I just feel like it is a, it is a performance sport. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel. Maybe it's closer to NASCAR. I'm not exactly sure, right. but uh, you know, I think it is sort of a performance sport. Right. Right. And, and, and you know, there's, there, there's sports, there's, there's, there's theater, there's, there's all sorts of different platforms out there where pe- performance is, is expected. And besides just cataract surgery, you also have one of the, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it, one of the, if not the most recognized ophthalmology power costs out there off the grid. And, you know, performance is, is part of uh, being a good host is, you know, being there, being attentive, being energetic and being excited. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, learning that right now that, you know, these, these initiatives are, you know, they're, they're one thing to be excited about, but executing is also hard as well. So, you know, it's good to have an idea, but to also, you know, take that idea and to put it out there consistently and have a, you know, a consistent, good volume of, uh, of content that, that you're proud of is another thing. And, um, you know, so talk to people out there who, who may be in my shoes or who are maybe even thinking about doing something like a podcast or a video channel or just some platform where they want to express themselves or do something creative and new um, for, in this generation in ophthalmology. You know, I think you have to, I mean, you have to really evaluate what you're doing and why you're doing it and mm-hmm. how is it going to be different from everyone else? Right. I mean, I'll be honest. I started a podcast really because I was lazy. Oh. Um, that may sound funny, but you know, I was getting some, you know, th- and I'm thankful for these, but uh, getting some opportunities to go and give talks like dinner talks on, for pharmaceutical companies or mm-hmm. about lenses or other things. And, you know, I have a family, I'm married, I've got two kids and I really uh, love being home and having time to spend with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just said to myself, you know, I'd really like to have an opportunity to, you know, contribute, to get my name out there. I thought, I thought that was kind of, you know, I think we do feel some level of, of pressure to be relevant, you know, and, and so I, I'm not immune to that. Mm-hmm. So I thought to myself, uh, you know, there's really not a lot of podcasting going on. Maybe instead of flying to various cities and giving dinner talks to, you know, 15 or 20 people at a time mm-hmm. about products that I may or may not be, you know, super excited about, why don't I just create a podcast and then I can actually just pipe in the content and I can stay at my, my desk and I can, you know, talk about whatever I want to talk about. I don't have to give a canned speech about X, Y, or Z. And again, I'm not trying to be critical about those things. You know, there, no. there are rules and guidelines that 
um, you know, sort of put, you know, handcuffs around what you can say, but I just didn't find that to be super fun. Mm -hmm. I thought having conversations with people very similar to what we're doing right now. I mean, I was having conversations with my friends who are ophthalmologists about interesting topics on a weekly basis anyways. Yeah. So I just figured, well, I just record it and share it. And if anyone wants to hear it, then that's great. But I mean, I'll, I'll really be honest. The, the key to the whole thing has not been me. I've, I've just had the blessing and fortune of having the smartest and most interesting friends mm -hmm. um, who are willing to come and share what they do. Because, you know, as a host, you don't really need to know anything. You just need to know the right questions to ask. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I feel like I've been a, you know, sort of a, you know, a kid sitting at the feet of these masters asking questions about mm -hmm. things I'm curious about and getting real time education. So yeah. for me, the podcast has been a, a way to um, sort of stay in the game, if you will, but mm -hmm. it's also been a way to learn and uh, you know, direct conversations uh, towards topics I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of those things where if you're a naturally curious person and uh, uh, let's face it, I think we're both slightly extroverted. So I think we yeah. have in common. Um, and, you know, I think it's one of those things where if you feel comfortable talking to people and you don't mind putting yourself out there, then it's kind of naturally something that you'll do. Um, you know, like this show is meant for the medical student audience. It's not as much focused on ophthalmologists. I love talking to ophthalmologists, but it's more focused for people who are stumbling and just learning. And we're not really sure what's going on, but we're trying to figure it out. Um, and, right. You know, and that's, it's, I think it's every, it's always about a niche audience or, you know, a, a focus of a group of people that you really feel like you resonate with. And, you know, you may not, I'm, I'm not trying to become the, I'm not trying to become the Joe Rogan podcast or, you know, one of those big ones, but you know, as long right. as satisfy the people who listen to this, I think that's important. I think you, you share that same sort of uh, opinion. Yeah, actually, I didn't even think about it as much. I just thought, well, if anyone wants to listen to this, then, then that'll be great. And if not, <laughs> I didn't really care. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just very happy that other people have found it to be valuable. And, um, you know, we, we continue to try to make it um, interesting and mm -hmm. stories evolve and yeah. as stories evolve you know I think that's been nice to be able to share those stories especially yeah. in the recent days with with COVID etc yeah and again you meet so many people too like I feel like I've met more people through this just this Twitter storm than anything else and it's been fun to make friends and you hope that you keep in touch with those people and you'll see how they progress too and you want to you know you want to root for them also so it's fun um, you know going Absolutely. back to uh, going back to that you know community building and, and learning from each other what I learned from you is actually really interesting is that when you came out of residency, you started a practice in a small town called Lebanon, Kentucky, which is pretty close to where I live. Uh, it's a really rural area. Um, and you started a practice that you kind of straight up told me kind of failed. I mean, you, you feel like you, you, you didn't do it right, but you learned a lot from that. Um, you know, a, a big part of the show is learning from failure and being open to failure. And you've become a success today to the point where you're recognized in a lot of places and, and, and you've uh, established yourself. So, how did that failure contribute to the brand you have today and to the person you've become? Yeah, that's a very, that's kind of a deep question. Uh, so let's try and unpack the layers of that. Um, you know, when I was in medical school, uh, I was married, had a couple kids and, you know, really by the time residency was done, I was in, I mean, just, I needed to find a job to make good money. Yeah. Um, the problem is that, you know, the place that you want to practice isn't always the place that has, you know, a great offer. You know, usually places that have, you know, that are very um, desirable to live, you know, you're not going to walk into a high salary job. Right. And so I have to say that, you know, it was sort of that siren song of, of more money. And, and I thought I was, you know, a good enough ophthalmologist coming out of residency. And I, I, re I thought I was, you know, smart enough to figure out the complexities of running a business. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality was I was outmatched. I did not realize uh, the complexities of, you know, being a business owner, let alone in one of the most convoluted and complex business models in the world, which is running a medical practice. You know, not only do you have the normal hiring and firing, but you have to find people with a certain skill set, right. and in in various places around the country, that is that is in short supply. So you have to train people or be willing to train people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that was a situation where it was trial by fire. But you learn so much when, you know, when you go through something like that, you know, I, I could have learned by going and joining a practice and I would have sort of learned by osmosis. Right. I never would have really realized how complicated it was. And I try, unless I try to figure it out myself. So 
I have to say, when I go into my billing office right now, I'm just like, can I, can I do anything for you all? Yeah. Uh, what can I do to make your life better? I mean, I realize it's a, it's a struggle to get paid. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm thankful for my technicians. I'm thankful for all the people who work for me because I tried to do it once. And I'll tell you, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, an easy process. Sure. Um, I, will, I will say that I, you know, I really enjoyed um, a lot of my patients down in that area. It's a yeah. very sweet town. Yeah. full of wonderful people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that part I don't regret at all. I really don't regret any of it yeah. uh, because it did show me that, uh, you know, failure is, is very rarely final. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't want to go bankrupt and you don't want to, you don't want to lose everything. You don't want to die. Right. So, but if you can keep out of like jail and bankruptcy and uh, divorce court and yeah. uh, keep yourself alive, mm-hmm. you know, just understand that life, is a messy sport. It's a messy game full yeah. of ups and downs. Mm-hmm. And um, the best of us make mistakes or misjudge a situation. Sure. And that's okay. Yeah. And as long as you keep moving forward, um, just don't let that failure be, you know, like uh, some sort of hex in your mind psychologically where you, where you sort of say that this is who I am. It doesn't have to become part of your identity. Mm -hmm. What you can say is, you know, this was a thing that happened to me and I learned from it and now I'm better for it. Sure. And I think that's huge for anybody who's a medical student or maybe even a resident or or a fellow or whoever's starting the job market right now is that willingness to change and adapt and and just be open with it maybe. And uh, I don't want to speak for people who are above me in training, but I guess I can speak for people who are at my stage. Like it's, it's very hard to be open in, in a public setting, like, Oh yes, let's fail. Let's, let's keep failing. But you know, when you experience failure, I think maybe then you, you internalize it more and you learn from it. I think that's a growth um, that you're talking about. Um, yeah. something, that you, something that you shared with me, which was awesome. Uh, we were eating lunch in your office and, and we were talking about, you know, my show and, and you were telling me just some, you were giving me some pearls of advice about, you know, how to, how to go about just like kind of creating what you want to have a vision for. And, and I have a vision for this show, what I want it to become someday, or I want to have sustainability. And I think that's important. Um, and you direct me towards a podcast called uh, it's Naval. Naval. Um, and it's, it's, yep. It's how to get rich without getting lucky. And I told a friend of mine that and he said, well, I want to listen to the podcast, how to get lucky without being rich. So <laughs> that, that would be a different podcast, but yes, Naval is a, uh, is a kind of a guru of mine. I love listening to everything he puts out. So, um, yeah, and I know you listen to it. And one of the real interesting things about that podcast is he talks about, um, specific knowledge yeah, and trying to figure out, you know, every person sort of has um, some things that they're talented at naturally. It's just sort of the way they're wired. Like you mentioned earlier, you're extroverted. So that means you're, you know, more likely, you know, good at working with people. But if you look at the, at the projects that have been most exciting to you, not just for the reward, but actually for the, the, the work of it. So exactly. um, that's where I think you find a lot of the specific knowledge. And so, you know, I've, I've sort of done some thinking about what is my specific knowledge? What do I bring to the world in, in any setting, whether it's, you know, being on the school board or being, you know, an entrepreneur in, in, mm-hmm. in my practice. And, you know, I really feel like I, I really try and I thrive in situations where I can take something that is a complex problem and mm-hmm. breaking it down to, you know, a simple solution. Yeah. So that's kind of the way my mind works is I, I'm trying to look at very complex uh, problems right. and thinking about how do I make this much simpler so that it's something I don't have to keep thinking about. It's a problem that's solved. I can get off of my, you know, out of, out of my mental uh, space and yep. I can move on. So, you know, like my startup uh, Omega Ophthalmics, mm-hmm. you know, that started basically because I was frustrated that effective lens position is so variable. And, mm-hmm. and once we put a lens in the, in the capsular bag where it settles, um, largely determines the outcome of cataract surgery. And sure. so, um, and once it's implanted, it's hard to remove. So, you know, with, with sort of thinking about that, I came up with a solution for it and I've been pursuing that for, you know, about eight years now. So, you know, those are the, those are kind of the things that, uh, that make me um, excited about jumping on a project. And so mm-hmm. that's where I'll, I will actually think about whether or not I want to do something right. based on whether or not it really suits what I bring to most situations. Sure. Sure. So it's like, it's in the way I, when I was listening to the podcast, I took it as you have to kind of stay with what feels authentic and you have to play to your strengths and you have to do things that not that don't take energy away from you, but they give you energy. 
And, you know, I feel like through this whole application process and going through ophthalmology, it's stressful. Obviously, you might remember I'm trying to find your find your grasp on things. But one thing that's given me energy is like something like this, which is just like creative and fun where you can, you know, add your own flavor to something. And I feel like, you know, those are things that maybe specific knowledge is talking about. So for anybody who hasn't heard the podcast out there, it's it's a Naval podcast, uh, how to get rich without getting lucky. Um, and uh, it's, it's three and a half hours long, but it's worth every minute. And uh, just listen to it when you're driving or something. It took me a while, but you know, I have to listen to it again. I think it's one of those things where you have to listen to it a couple times. For oh, sure. totally. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think that it, every person, mm-hmm. I, even more than listening to this, I mean, I love promoting you, but for their own good, they should, they should listen to this podcast. It's basically yeah. like everything you need to know about business and life, mm-hmm. about what is money and why do we need it and status mm-hmm. versus wealth and yeah you know, playing stupid games, getting, winning stupid prizes and the things that people do that are really uh, nonsense that they shouldn't worry about. I mean, it's really like, it's like a life skills slash business um, MBA in three and a half hours. Yeah. So three and a half hours may sound like a long time, but the amount of knowledge that you can actually attain and, and wisdom in that three and a half hours is unbelievable. And I've, I think that that should be like a high school course that every high school student should have to like take a course on this podcast yeah. and, and demonstrate some level of understanding yeah. um, about how wealth is not a zero sum gain. That's yeah. a huge thing. You know, I'd always kind of thought it was, you know, yeah. there's makers and takers. And so anyways, I don't want to spoil too much of the podcast, no, but, but yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And I, and I, I continue to listen to it over and over again because yeah. uh, there's a lot of content there. Yeah. And there's almost a philosophy to it where it's like, I, I don't know anything about making money and I don't think you should ever chase money. You should just chase doing what you love and hopefully you get paid for it. But like you said, there's that concept in the, in the beginning of the podcast that talks about wealth versus status and status is a zero sum game where no one wins. You're always trying to outbeat somebody else. Whereas wealth is something where everybody can win. If you share in that with other people, you can promote them, help them and, and you can all win together, which is, I thought that was just an awesome right. to think about. Um, so yeah, to everybody who hasn't seen it or listened to it, check it out worth your time. Um, and thank you for pointing it out to me. I really appreciate it. Um, something that, you know, kind of goes back to wealth is something that you started. Uh, you talk about how you like complex problems. You like creating simple solutions, um, for people out there who are applying for ophthalmology, there's the master, um, ophthalmology residency document. That's a Google document, um, that's been going around every year on student doctor network. Um, since basically the early 2000s and it has basically you know which programs um, offer interviews for away rotations or which which programs have uh, how many cataract numbers or which programs have are more research oriented or which programs um, you know are are have have more residents or less residents so it's one of those it was one of those documents that kind of revolutionized uh, a central source to find information like that what people don't know is you were actually the first person to come up with that and you actually created that document um, and put it on Student Doctor Network. So talk about that. Yeah, so I was on the Student Doctor Network. This is like pre-Facebook days. So there was no social media at this time. I know that really dates me. So, um, you know, I'm older than you may realize. But um, so yeah, Student Doctor Network was sort of my my place on the internet where I like to go and talk to other aspiring ophthalmologists because there wasn't, I think there was two other people in my medical school class who wanted to be in ophthalmology, mm-hmm. but I realized that there's probably a much bigger network. And I, I mean, the student doctor, doctor network was great. Mm-hmm. And so really kind of bonded with a bunch of the, the, the people who are in my application class. Um, I really don't know who any of them are because we all had these like internet names. That yeah. Can, you know, correlate with our real names. Right. Um, Andy Doan or Andrew Doan was the uh, moderator back then. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were sort of, it wasn't just me, you know, there were other people who were sort of saying, hey, we should maybe share some data. Right. But um, as, as we were sort of processing it, I said, you know, we really need to um, share once, we're, once we've matched, we need to have an anonymous way that we can share our board scores, our class rank, AOA status, number of honors or class rank, those sorts of things. And like where we got interviews at and where we matched and what number it was on our list. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically just some general metrics so that, you know, if you wanted to go to, you know, wherever, if you want to go to Indiana or Michigan or Vanderbilt or UK or Duke, you know, you kind of have a little bit of an idea of the kind of 
qualifications you need mm -hmm. to think that's going to happen for you. So um, it's really, I didn't know it actually lived on. I figured that it had failed, you know, I'd, I don't know, stopped at some point or whatever. I was asking you when you came, I was like, hey, is that thing still around? And I was kind of surprised that it, it's still going. So oh, yeah. I hope it's been helpful to people. It was very helpful. I mean, it didn't really help me because we started it in 2007 ish. Um, but I, I hope, or no, that was like 2004. I think oh, we started you dated 2003, your... 2004. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'm glad that it's uh, still around. That's cool. Yeah. And sometimes you do things without getting merit for it or recognition, no recognition for it. And I think those are things that honestly say a lot about you. If, if you just, if you're not thinking about getting anything from it, you just do it because it makes someone else, someone else's life easier. And, um, you know, I think that document helps a lot of people who, you know, like me don't have home programs and we're just trying to get a gauge of where are places that would be friendly to us or, or may, you know, look at us closer. Um, so I think those things pay forward a lot and, um, thanks for doing it. And I'm sure some mentions like me have also had a little bit of anxiety looking at it sometimes because we're like, Oh my God, some people are crazy competitive <laughs> and I don't know if I'm at that level, but you know, still I just like, I wonder if some people lie about it. I mean, right? I, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know why you would after you've already matched and no. you know it's anonymous so your name yeah. isn't attached to it but people are weird sometimes like yeah. that so. insecurity to live on i guess for some so yeah. unfortunately yeah. those people out there but you know for people out there like you who who've made, who paid it forward in so many ways thank you and thank you for coming on the show tonight i mean i know that you're busy i know you just got back into the swing of things after covid and for you to take time out of your night to come talk with just a med student like me with the famous off the grid background uh, behind you it means a lot so yeah hey Bilal you know what we're all uh, rooting for you um, it's been just a pleasure and a joy to get to know you and um, I wish you nothing but the best I know you're going to come back down to Lexington in the near future uh, for the uh, UK out rotation and so you know look me up we'll maybe yeah. go grab dinner at some point again sure. and uh, man I'm rooting for you I know you've uh, helped a lot of people and um I think that um, you've, you've done yourself a, a good service and your, your fellow applicants a, a service by um, helping people get connected. And that's a really big, that's important. Well, thanks so much. Uh, the kind words mean a lot and hopefully it keeps going. And it's always for med students. I think it's always good to keep looking out for the, for the little people. So uh, we'll, we'll pass it on hopefully like you did and, and we'll see what happens. So, yeah, thanks. always, always, always look over your shoulder to the people who are coming up behind you because uh, they're they're looking for someone to lead them. They're looking for some mentorship. So when you uh, when you get into residency, realize that uh, there's probably medical students that you can invest in, and yep. if you do that, you know that's that's part of this culture. I think we've we've built in ophthalmology. So it's it's really cool. Well, Doctor Words, I will see you in Lexington. We'll have to get dinner with masks on, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more then. Alrighty. Awesome, Bilal. Thank right, you. Take care. Thanks for coming.